Okay, thank you very much. So hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the R uh, ERCCT for giving me this opportunity to share part of my research with you today. And especially I would like to thank Stefan Dreyck, Gunther Schubert and Beatrice Zani. Beatrice who contacted me to participate in this colloquium. So even though she's not here today, since the, the session is being recorded, Beatrice, if you ever watch the recording of the session, thank you very much. Um, and I was particularly interested in participating in this colloquium um, since the epistemology and the methodology uh, of studying the Taiwan Strait lies at the core of my research. Because actually, no matter the expression used, either that of relations between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait or relation across the Taiwan Strait, the imagined cartography of the area always remain the same. It implies that the Taiwan Strait articulates a relationship between the two entities circumscribed by its shores. So mainland China on the west and Taiwan on the east. However, this imagined cartography contradicts the political cartography of the area. The sovereignty of the ROC, the Republic of China, spans across the Taiwan Strait by encompassing the archipelago of Jinmen, located off the coast of Fujian, facing the city of Xiamen. And it's composed of two main islands, the island of Jinmen proper, sometimes called uh, Greater Jinmen or Da Jinmen, and the island of Little Jinmen, Xiao Jinmen, also called Lieyu. It has an area of 150 square kilometers and it is home to 50 to 60,000 inhabitants who live there permanently. And here are a few pictures taken from the coasts of uh, Jinmen and Xiamen so that if you've never been there already, you can somehow experience the proximity between the two territories by yourself. This mismatch between geographic outlines and political borders is hardly reintroduced by actors and observers of the Taiwan Strait. According to researchers in Taiwan studies I have met since I have begun my research back in 2016 for my PhD and 2014 for my master's thesis, um, it would be due to uh, mere simplification because according to them, Jinmen is a small territory with a small number of inhabitants so that there would be nothing wrong in putting it aside for the sake of pragmatism. But this argument is not completely satisfying per se and for two reasons. First, it's not completely satisfying because Jinmen is the only significant border territory between the PRC and the ROC. And second, it's not completely satisfying because Jinmen has been the main target of the two, Taiwan's, the two first Taiwan Strait crises in the 1950s. And it has been the only repository of the open civil war between the two states up until 1978. So in other words, Jinmen, uh, Jinmen's small size is conversely proportional to its strategic significance. That's why today I would like to emphasize the mismatch between the geographic outlines and the political borders during this presentation to transform this blind spot uh, into a focal point and to take Jinmen as a lens in order to, I hope, shed a new light on cross-strait relations. <clears throat> so first, I will try to explain how Jinmen has been invisibilized in the cartography of the Taiwan Strait beyond mere arguments of pragmatism. Uh, so this implies to put um, geographic determinism aside and to consider the Taiwan Strait as a political construct uh, to eventualize the Taiwan Strait to use Michel Foucault's concept. Then I will analyze cross-strait relations within the ROC and try to explain the place and the role of Jinmen within the transformations of the ROC state since 1949. 
And to finish, uh, I will insist on the place and the role of Tinmen uh, within relations between the two sides of the strait in terms of political development. So that means between independence and unification. So first of all, uh, I need to take you back to 1949. Um, at the time of the Chinese partition, the Taiwan Strait articulates not one, but two sovereignty issues regarding Chinese unity. Uh, the first issue is articulated in terms of territory or population. Uh, the question being, uh, does Taiwan within its borders of a former Japanese colony belong to the Chinese nation? And the second one being articulated in terms of government which government is the sole legitimate representative of the whole of the Chinese nation, that of the PRC or that of the ROC. So the first issue really emerges in 1947 as a political consequence of the 28th February incident of Ashijian. Because 16 month, months after Japan handed back Taiwan to China, the Taiwanese population rises against the specific administrative regime their province has been subjected to, a specific regime implemented by the ROC due to the Japanese colonial past of Taiwan. And the bloody suppression of this movement by the Chinese Nationalist Army leads to radicalize a fringe of the Taiwanese opposition, which no longer advocates for mere autonomy within China, but for an independence of Taiwan as a sovereign state. So in this context, Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait become an issue in terms of Chinese unity outside of the logic of the Chinese civil war, which is raging on the mainland. However, both the CCP and the KMT almost immediately explain the Urba incident in the framework of the civil war in order to advocate for their own interests. And Taiwan matters even more to them that Chiang Kai-shek plans to make the island of Taiwan his fallback base in the perspective of uh, further communist victories on the mainland, since the Taiwan Strait would offer him um, a buffer would, could act as a buffer zone and could offer him temporary protection from a communist attack. And this plan becomes a reality in December 1949, two months after the foundation of the PRC. So in other words, uh, in late 1949, since both parties, the KMT and the CCP, agree that Taiwan belongs to the Chinese nation, they conceal this dimension of the sovereignty issue behind that of the sole government legitimate to exert sovereignty over the whole of China. And until mid-1950, this issue is expected to be solved quickly, either by liberating Taiwan, Jiefang Taiwan, or by recovering the mainland, Guangfu Dalu. In this context, Jinmen does not emerge as a specific case worth of consideration. And the PR PRC even tried to invade it in October 1949 during the Guningtou battle, Guningtou Jani, which is called Jinmen Jani on the mainland. But things change uh, when the US intervened in the Taiwan Strait in June 1950. Because in the context of the outburst of the Korean War, the US justified the neutralization of the Taiwan Strait by its seventh fleet by raising the theory of the undetermined status of Taiwan in international law. So you have the quote of Harry Truman in June, 1950. Um, for this issue of the undetermined status of Taiwan in inter international law to be peacefully settled, um, the US assumes that the civil war, the Chinese civil war must come to a halt and that the ROC should evacuate the last islands and archipelagos it still uh, occupies along the coast of uh, southern China, Jinmen being the most important of these, uh, of these islands and archipelagos at that time. And Western governments in general consider that the international status of these islands and archipelagos aren't subjected to any doubt and that they belong to China 
which sever the government legitimate to represent China as a whole. Such a stance is considered as unacceptable by both the PRC and the ROC because it could lead to the subtraction of Taiwan from any Chinese sovereignty, either that effective, the effective sovereignty of the ROC or the claimed sovereignty of the PRC. And even though the ROC accepts to evacuate most of these islands and archipelagos, uh, it ultimately leads to a double refusal when there are only three archipelagos left, Jinmen, Uchiou, and Matu. But Uchiou and, and, and Matu are really smaller than Jinmen. And they are located less, far, uh, less close to the mainland than Jinmen. So a, a double refusal, the, a refusal of the ROC to evacuate Jinmen and a refusal of the PRC to invade Jinmen without simultaneously invading Taiwan. So in other words, provided that the ROC maintains control over Jinmen, Taiwan remains anchored to China. The discontinuity along the coast of the Chinese mainland actually stems from a quest of continuity across the strait. And the climate of war is artificially sustained by the PRC which bombs Jinmen every other day since 1958 onwards. It, it was called the Danda, Shuang Buddha. Um, so the PRC finally achieved its goal uh, in mid-December 1978, when the US announced the establishment of formal relations in Be with Beijing, which will come into effect on January 1st, 1979. And therefore, the PRC decides to stop bombing Jinmen. Actually, the establishment of diplomatic relations with the PRC is determined by two prerequisites, which echo the twofold sovereignty issue across the Taiwan Strait that I introduced in the, the first subpart. First, it implies to acknowledge. Uh, that the PRC is the sole legitimate state to represent China as a whole. And second, it implies to acknowledge that Taiwan is a part of China. Many countries have actually, many Western countries essentially, have actually acknowledged that the PRC assumes that Taiwan is part of China without completely adhering to this, to this principle. So that's how these countries, these third countries managed to maintain an official relations with the ROC on the basis of uh, the undetermined status of Taiwan in international law. For, for instance, the, the Taiwan Relations Act voted by the US Congress in 1979 gives a good example of this strategy. Because if you look at the text of the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, if you look at the definition it gives of Taiwan, this definition actually corresponds to the borders of Taiwan as a former Japanese colony. Penghu is mentioned in this text and Jinmen is not, although Jinmen is slightly bigger than Penghu. So it's not a matter of size of territories. It's just that this strategy is actually rooted in the, uh, the theory of the undetermined status of Taiwan in inter international law. So facing this tendency, the PRC issued in, issued in 1993, its first white paper about the so-called Taiwan issue, Taiwan 1T. And in this white paper, the civil war between the KMT and the CCP is reduced to a mere sequence of the relations between mainland China and Taiwan throughout the ages. And the partition of China uh, becomes deprived of its own historicity and Jinmen is definitely put into a blind spot. So all in all, the two sovereignty issues across the strait have merged into one, the, the so-called Taiwan issue, leading to a forced congruence between Taiwan within its borders of a former Japanese colony and the territory under ROC's control. So such a process is also applied within the framework of Taiwan studies, 
which tend to consider cross-trait relations as diachronic relations between the two entities circumscribed by the two shores of the Taiwan Strait. And more precisely, because the object of study of Taiwan studies, as its name suggests, is Taiwan per se, the study of the St Taiwan Strait derives from the study of Taiwan. So now that we have explained how Jinmen has been invisibilized in the conception of the Taiwan Strait as a political construct, it is important to insist on the fact that there's no need to regret or to condemn this invisibilization. It is more a heuristic to take it as an entry point to the study of the Taiwan Strait and to analyze its performative effects on Jinmen and its society. So that's how I come to my second part, the cross threat relations within the ROC, one country, two systems. So I know that the title may seem provocative, but actually this reappropriation of the one country, two systems formula in the case of Jinmen <clears throat> is, has been done by proponents of democracy in Jinmen them, themselves. Okay, so that it's not me using the PRC's formula to apply it to Jinmen, it's people from Jinmen who use it, but I will explain it later. <clears throat> so first, once again, back in 1949, uh, in order to achieve his goal of recovering uh, main, the mainland, Chiang Kai-shek applied what we could call a functionalist division of uh, the ROC's remaining territory based on both geography and history. So Jinmen on the western side of the strait becomes the first line of defense of Taiwan and also a stepping stone for the recovery of the mainland. And Taiwan on the eastern side of the strait becomes the sanctuary of a withdrawn ROC, both as a fallback base and as a beacon of Chinese nationalism. These two roles are actually sustained by specific modes of domination, a, military, a militarization of Jinmen and a colonization, or at least a fictitious colonization of Taiwan. So concretely, Jinmen becomes subjected to a distinct administrative regime, the War Zone Administration, Zhang Di Zhengwu, implemented in 1956, which imposes uh, or officializes actually a state of exception in Jinmen and therefore excludes it from the processes at work in the rest of the ROC. Uh, Jinmen citizens are enrolled in a civilian militia system, the Minfang Tui, and are deprived of most of their political rights and contacts uh, between the Jinmen and the outside world are drastically diminished. And for instance, at that time, for Jinmen inhabitants to go to Taiwan, they had, had to apply for specific travel documents. So it was as demanding as trying to leave the ROC to go from Jinmen to Taiwan. On the other side of the strait, Taiwan becomes the sole crucible of the ROC's state transformations and especially of the re-territorialization of the ROC. Because in order to stabilize the island of Taiwan as a sanctuary of the ROC, the KMT keeps on sinicizing the local population through colonial means and reinforces the community division between the Waishangren and the Benchangren implemented since 1945. But in order to limit the risk of another popular uprising, local elections uh, take place from 1950 onwards, only in Taiwan, not in Jinmen. Uh, and these elections enable two processes. First, the co-optation of the Benchangren elite into the KMT, which leads to the Taiwanization of the party state. And second, the progressive constitution of a strictly Taiwanese opposition to the KMT, first with the development of the Danghuai movement in the 1970s, and then with the creation of the DPP, which actually stems from the Danghuai movement 
in 1986. So in other words, the re-territorialization of the ROC has happened outside of Jinmen and without taking Jinmen into consideration. That's why despite uh, the ROC's territory being slightly greater than Taiwan proper, demands for democratization coming from the opposition have been intertwined uh, with claims for a regime indigenization in Taiwan proper, so with Taiwanization. So in Jinmen, the martial law and the war zone administration have been lifted in 1992, so five years after Taiwan proper. And this time lag of five years is actually indicative of how Jinmen has been overlooked in the implementation of democratization measures in the ROC. Actually, Jinmen has been dragged into a process which has not been tailored for it. <clears throat> and as a consequence, measures of Taiwanization, which are understood as contributing to a decolonization of Taiwan, lead to somehow a Taiwanese paracolonization of Jinmen. And I'm talking about paracolonization because Taiwanization does not explicitly aim at Taiwani Taiwanizing people from Jinmen and Taiwanizing Jinmen. It's rather a, a form of a side effect or an unexpected consequence of the mismatch between the limits of the Taiwanese immigrant community and the actual borders of the ROC. So one of the most salient illustrations of this paracolonization takes place in the process of writing a national history. Because students of Jinmen are you know, expected to learn the history of Taiwan, a history influenced by a Taiwanese nativist paradigm, which does not take Jinmen into consideration. And in general, the national history in the ROC contrasts the history of Taiwan with the history of China as a whole, without trying to consider the history of the whole territory under ROC's sovereignty and puts Jinmen into a blind spot. And in reaction to this process, Jinmen local authorities have encouraged the creation of knowledge about Jinmen proper, leading even leading to the development of an academic field of his own, that of Jinmen studies, Jinmen Chue. <clears throat> and forgetting Jinmen becomes even more prejudicial when it comes to transitional justice. Because on the one hand, the main efforts in this field have been conducted, conducted regarding the Urba incident, which is completely alien to Jinmen. And on the other hand, uh, efforts pertaining to the white terror tend to focus on Taiwan proper. For instance, when the um, Act for the Promotion of Transi Transitional Justice, sorry, was debated in the Legislative UN in 2018, uh, the pre preliminary debates show that the draft law initially considered that the, the period of the white terror ended in 1991 with the lift of the temporary provisions against the communist rebellion, while the martial law had been lifted on Jinmen in 1992. So this, despite all of this, Jinmen and its inhabitants have somehow finally managed to find their place within a Taiwanized and democratized ROC through the sta status of uh, offshore island. Lead, uh, leader, which has been sanctified by national law in, in 2000 with the Offshore Islands Development Act. So the central government adopted such classification to promote the development of islands and archipelagos under Taipei's sovereignty while being detached from Taiwan Island. So the term Lidao is in self, is evocative in itself, sorry, because the use of the character Li 
instead of y, insists on the existence of a link across the strait between Taiwan Island and Jinmen. So in other words, Taiwan Island is actually depicted as the mainland towards which the insularity of Jinmen is defined against any form of geograph geographic and historical determinism. In this sense, Jinmen becomes a kind of a Taiwanese of a sisterry with its distinct historical trajectory, its own path to development, and its own welfare policies. And in, interestingly, according to the 10th additional article to the ROC constitution, the peoples of the of, uh, offshore islands are granted the same rights as Taiwanese Aboriginal peoples. So this notion of um, being a remote territory is frequently reused by local politicians and citizens of Jinmen because it enables them to express their local interests and specificities within the framework of a unitary state, or at least within the framework of a coherent space uh, between Taiwan and Jinmen. And especially when it comes to their relations with mainland China. So I come to the last part of my presentation. Um, Jinmen and the China-Taiwan divide, an in-between or a tipping point. So since the, the lift of the martial law and the war zone administration in 1992 in Jinmen, Jinmen local authorities have long demanded the, to liberalize exchanges between Jinmen and Xiamen in order to ensure the development of their territory and also to contribute to peace across the Taiwan Strait. And in 2001, Chen Shui-bian decides to allow direct contacts between Jinmen and Xiamen with the implementation of what is called the three mini links, Xiao San Tong, which pertain to people, goods, and mail. And actually, this was a sort of a compromise for Chen Shui-bian, who initially wanted to open direct links, direct contact between Taiwan Island and the mainland. Uh, but he refused to stick to the one China principle, so he had to make a compromise to satisfy notably, especially the, um, the Taishang established on the mainland. And that's why he decided to open the links between Jinmen and Xiamen, and also between Matu and, and Fuzhou, but actually those between Jinmen and Xiamen are way more convenient because Jinmen is located closer to the mainland and Jinmen is a bigger territory and Jinmen is better linked to Taiwan Island than Matsu is to Taiwan Island. So direct contact with the mainland has brought an important source, source of revenue for Jinmen, since their inhabitants can access the, the job market in Xiamen, and mainland tourists can come uh, and visit Jinmen. Jinmen were, and that's somehow interesting to know, uh, the biggest uh, Asia's biggest duty-free store has been, implement, has been implemented in 2015. So direct links are also used to purchase everyday goods. So for everyday goods for Jinmen people who come to Xiamen to find cheaper goods. And for the, for the mainland tourists, they, they also come to Jinmen to buy some sensi sensitive goods which have been subjected to sanitary scandals on the mainland, such as powder milk or medication. <clears throat> so the, the direct links between Jinmen and, and Xiamen has become part of the way of life in Jinmen. And since 2018, the buzzword is now that of the new fallings, the Xin Si Tong, among, among which one has already been implemented. So that of drinking water with a pipeline linking uh, Jinmen to Chuanzhou, and which opened in 2018. Uh, so the um, Jinmen imports fresh water from Chuanzhou. And the three other new links are those of electricity, 
uh, natural gas, and also a bridge which is planned to link the northeastern part of Jinmen Island to Dadeng Island. Uh, sorry, I just show you where Dadeng is. So Dadeng is this island, this island where a new airport is being built, is currently being built um, to replace the Xiamen Gaoqi uh, Airport. <clears throat> so these projects are actually not warm-heartedly favored by Taipei central government, which fears that Jinmen might become overly dependent on the mainland. And according to Taipei, such dependency might also help the PRC in its strategy of national unification. So what's the strategy of the PRC towards Jinmen? It's quite interesting to note that the PRC is still not interested in Jinmen per se. According to its strategy, Jinmen can become a showcase for the PRC's goodwill towards Taiwan by contributing to the well being of Jinmen inhabitants. But the mainland has still no interest in swallowing Jinmen without swallowing Taiwan at the same time. And ultimately, their strategy hasn't changed since the 1950s. Because absorbing only Jinmen into the PRC, be it by force or by peaceful means, could once again sever the link between Taiwan and mainland China. And that would be counter counterproductive to national reunification. And according to the PRC, the national unification cannot be treated as separate lots. And interestingly, in this sense, within the framework of the one country, two systems formula, the PRC does not plan on integrating Jinmen back to Fujian province, but would include it into a potential Taiwan special administrative region. So the fate of Jinmen, according to the PRC, is linked to the fate of Taiwan. So in other words, all in all, according to Beijing, rapprochement with Jinmen is deemed as efficient only provided that it could be used as a tipping point to achieve national reunification. Yet until now, Jinmen has never proven to be able to assume such a role. And that's why Beijing does not make Jinmen a priority. And even in Xiamen, if you've ever been to Xiamen, you might have seen that the bulk of efforts towards national unification are clearly targeted towards Taiwan Island across the Taiwan Strait. And that's also because Xiamen is way less dependent on Jinmen than the other way around. <clears throat> so to finish, I'd like to mention the, the case of of Jinmen people themselves. What do they want when it comes to national unification? Because further rapprochement between Jinmen and Xiamen has triggered some debate about the fate of Jinmen within the ROC. And it's important to note that Taiwan independence hardliners have for long um, demanded that a referendum should take place in Jinmen uh, in order for Jinmen inhabitants to take a stance on this issue, either by siding with China or with Taiwan. But recent developments pertaining to the new four links, the four new links have made this debate more mainstream in a way. And in 2018, one of Taiwan's advisors, uh, Huang Tianlin, even published a piece in, uh, uh, in the Liberty Times, Zhe Yoshiba, to ask for such a referendum to be held. However, for the bulk of Jinmen inhabitants, this alternative is a false choice. Because on the one hand, uh, siding explicitly with Taiwan would irritate the mainland, the mainland which could sever links with Jinmen or launch an attack across the strait. Uh, sorry, siding with China and the PRC would imply renouncing to their way of life and democracy to which they are more and more attached and siding with Taiwan 
would irritate the mainland, which could sever links with Jinmen or launch an attack, uh, an attack across the strait. So for now, what's important to remember is that Jinmen thrives as an in-between within the ROC. And most of its in inhabitants want to avoid the political dimension of rapprochement with the mainland as long as their well being is ensured. However, uh, it seems that a generational shift is on its way among the population of Jinmen. And because after eight month, months of fieldwork in Jinmen, it appeared to me that the younger the interviewee, the greater their tendency to identify themselves with Taiwan, not only with the ROC, and the greater their tendency to consider China and not only the PRC as a foreign country. And this is due notably to the fact that the people being born just before or after 1992 have grown up within a democratized environment, a democratized and a Taiwanized environment and have been able to travel freely to Taiwan, where maybe they have studied, they have done their higher education there, they have worked there, and they have been to been able to politically socialize in Taiwan proper. And also through the use of the three mini links, they have been able to go to the mainland and to compare Jinmen to the mainland and somehow find that in a way there are more differences between Jinmen and the mainland than between Jinmen and Taiwan. So to conclude, remapping the Taiwan Strait, what I tried to do today, remapping the Taiwan Strait by reintroducing the specific case of Jinmen holds heuristic value since it forces the researcher to put geographic and historical determinisms aside. And it forces to explore a gray zone, which depending on the criteria used, may be linked to the mainland, linked to Taiwan, linked to both Taiwan and the mainland, or linked to none of them. And in this perspective, studying Jinmen, not for itself, as it is the case for Jinmen studies, but in relation with both sides of the strait, contributes to renew the study of this area as a whole and to call into question what is generally considered as self-evident facts. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>